If you would please uh, turn in your Bible for just a minute to the index page. All right, now, on your index page there, you're going to see it says the books of the Old Testament. Amen? Thank you, Pastor. 39 books in the Old Testament, they constitute about 4,000 years of history. All right, so uh, today, I'm going to try and preach through 4,000 years of history in 45 minutes. So I got to preach about 88 years a minute. And, uh, and so pray for me. All right, let's have a word of prayer. Father, we come before you in the name of Jesus, God. There is, there just is no other name. And uh, we praise you, God. We thank you, Lord. I've been so blessed, God in my 40 plus years of salvation. And uh, I know, God, that when you got me, you didn't get much, but I sure am glad you got me. And so I pray now, Lord, help me get myself straightened up here and, and, uh, and to, to preach what you gave me. And I pray to be a blessing to people, Father. And I pray that Jesus Christ to be glorified, Lord. And I ask it in that one and only name, the name of Jesus. Amen. All right. So I'm going to hit my start button. Start praying. <laughs> 88 years a minute. All right. So to lay a foundation for what I'm getting ready to tell you, uh, I, want to, I want to throw a few things out there. Maybe you never heard before, and that's okay. And, uh, and if you're interested, I think this is being recorded anyway for YouTube or whatever, and then what we do here. And so if you ever want to, you can go back and re-listen to it again, all right? But uh, so I'm going to lay some groundwork before I, before I get into what I'm doing. First thing I want to tell you that the Bible talks about three heavens. Paul tells us he was called up to the third heaven in, uh, in uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 12, all right? And he tells us about that. Now, if you don't understand what those three heavens are, I'm going to give them to you real quick. First heaven is atmosphere. The birds fly through the heavens, okay? The second heaven is what we would refer to as space, all right? So the sun, moon, and stars, and the earth are in the heaven, second heaven, okay? The third heaven is beyond the what we call space. You say, well, I can't conceive of that. Neither can I, but so, so what? You know, there's a lot of things I can't conceive of. and uh, But the third heaven is up there. And Paul said he got called up to the third heaven. That's the domain of God. All right. So heaven is a real place. It is a location. The third heaven I'm talking about right now, it's a location where people go. The Bible says New Jerusalem comes down from God out of heaven. It's a place. Uh, the direction of that place is even north. The Bible says promotion cometh not from the east, the south, or the west. But God is the judge. Substitute God for north. So we'll get more into that in a little bit, but there's three heavens. All right, the next thing I want to talk to you about real fast, laying some quick groundwork, is the kingdom of heaven. Now, the problem that most people have with the idea of the kingdom of heaven is that they, when they think the kingdom of heaven, they think heavenly. Now, heavenly is an adjective, and heaven is a noun. Heaven's a place. It's not a description. Amen? Okay, so uh, there is three heavens. And so when the Bible is talking about a heaven, you have to pay attention to which one it's talking about. Now, the kingdom of heaven is not the domain of God. The kingdom of heaven is, has to do with the physical creation. And I want you to understand that. Okay, and I can't go through the whole thing about it, but I'm going to give you some quick points on it so you understand. All right. Uh, for instance, Jesus said this. He said, from the days of John the Baptist until now, the kingdom of heaven suffered violence, and the violent take it by force. So, well, how, how can you take uh, the kingdom of heaven by force? Because the kingdom of heaven has to do with the physical creation. All right? So what's that mean, take it by force? It means this. It means that uh, should Canada decide 
that they want to uh, push their borderline into North Dakota, we would probably have a problem with that. Okay? And there would be a fight. And the kingdom of heaven would suffer violence, and somebody's going to take it by force. And that might be the same in your house. Somebody might try to come take your property, and you might have to put up a fight over it. And then when you read the Old Testament, you read about kingdoms pushing their borders back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. Okay. And by the way, just so you understand, what I'm hoping to accomplish in this message today is to stir your interest in reading the Bible. Because God's people need to be Bible readers. Amen. They need to be Bible readers because we don't know what in the world we're floundering. We don't know what we're doing without the Bible. Okay. So uh, Jesus said that the kingdom of heaven suffers violence and the violent take it by force. Uh, here's another one. It says, uh, Many shall come from the east and the west and sit down in the kingdom of heaven with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. But the children of the kingdom shall be cast into outer darkness. There shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. If you think that the kingdom of heaven is the church, I got bad news for you. You're going to outer darkness. Look, that is not us. That's not what that's talking about. That's talking about the children of the physical kingdom. Who's the children of the physical kingdom? Turns out that it's, it's actually Israel. Right. And uh, and so there's a there's a chunk of Israel going to go into outer darkness. It's just the way it is. And to this very day, they're still rejecting Christ. All right. So uh, the children of the kingdom shall be cast into outer darkness. I didn't get saved. I didn't get born again so I could go to hell. All right. You understand that? I'm assuming you didn't do the same thing either. Right. You know, that's not what that's talking about. So you want to understand that correctly. It's not talking about uh a spiritual kingdom. Uh, third thing it says, remember after Jesus resurrected, the apostles asked him, Lord, will thou restore again the kingdom to Israel? You know what kingdom they're talking about? They're talking about the kingdom that was promised to the Jews. It's referred to often, often in the Bible as the kingdom of heaven. All right. Next, I want to talk to you about the kingdom of God. Kingdom of God is a spiritual kingdom. Uh, for instance, uh, Romans 14, 17 says, the kingdom of God is not meat and drink. It's righteousness, joy, and peace in the Holy Ghost. It's a spiritual thing, okay? Uh, we know that the Bible, uh, they asked Jesus when the kingdom uh, would, would appear. He said, the kingdom of God cometh not with observation. You can't see it. Behold, the kingdom of God is in you. He said, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. It is a spiritual kingdom, all right? Why is it a spiritual kingdom? Why is he saying that? Because God is a spirit, and they that worship God must worship him in spirit and in truth, amen? So there's the differences in a nutshell. I could go a whole lot, I could say a whole lot more about it. If you want to see the distinction of the two kingdoms played out, look, look in the Bible at the difference between the parable of the pound and the parable of the talents. They're very, very similar, but the outcomes are totally different. Okay, and it's because of what kind of kingdom they are. All right? So now when Jesus shows up, he says to Israel, he says in, in the Sermon on the Mount, seek ye first the kingdom of God, and all these things shall be added unto you. If, you, if Israel, if you get right with God, you'll get the physical stuff that you are promised. Okay? Got it? All these things, things are physical, right? Things are physical. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. Get right with God. Then you'll get the kingdom that you've been promised. All right, now I had to lay that groundwork. All right, I got a little, one more piece of groundwork to lay. And that is during earth's earliest ages, uh, Lucifer, and a lot of people don't realize this, Lucifer was the ruler of the physical creation. He had a throne. You can read about it in Isaiah chapter 14. Here's what it says. How art thou fallen from, Lu from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? How art thou cut down to the ground which did weaken the nations? For thou hast said in thine heart, I will ascend into heaven. If he's going to ascend, if he's going to go up into heaven, then he's somewhere below heaven, right? I will ascend into heaven. He said, uh, I will exalt my throne. He said, uh, I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. If he's going to exalt his throne above the stars, then he's below the stars, right? 
Uh, I will sit also upon the mount of the congregation in the sides of the north. Didn't I tell you a little bit ago, heaven is north. You know, when you leave this planet and you head out toward uh, Polaris, the North Star, it's out that direction, way out there, way beyond Polaris somewhere. I don't know where, but it's way out there. That's what the Bible says. Talks about beautiful for situation is, joy, is the joy of the whole earth, heavenly Mount Zion situated on the sides of the north. The devil knew where it was, and that's where he was going. He said, I'm going to go against the sides of the north. I'll exalt my throne above the sides of the north. He was said, I will also sit upon the mountain of the congregation on the sides of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. So he must have been below the clouds. He's going to go above the clouds. I will be like the most high. His objective was to take his throne and take it up to heaven. And then he was going to, basically, he, he didn't feel like his kingdom was big enough for him. He had to have a bigger kingdom, and he thought, well, you know what, I, can, I think I can do God just as good as you can, you know, and he went up to try it, and it didn't, it didn't work out for him, okay? Now, as a result of that, God moves to replace rebellious Lucifer, and he makes a new king over the physical, the physical creation, and that king is man. And so we read in now, this is where we're going. We're starting in Genesis now, okay? And by the way, when you look at the word Genesis, you know what the first five letters of that is? G-E-N-E-S, genes. Genesis is about genetics. It's about beginnings, but it has a lot to do with genetics. Why? Because he's talking about man, all right? And you're going to see that follow through here in a little bit. All right, so he says, let us make man in our image after our likeness and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the fowl of the air, over the cattle, over all the earth. How do you know Adam was a king? Because Adam had dominion. And in the Bible, kings have dominion. Okay, so Adam was a king. He was the king of planet earth. All right, we also read in the Bible that, uh, well, let me ask you this question. Why did God make Adam in his image? Why did he do that? He didn't do it for, who said that? Yes, fellowship. That's exactly why. God was making somebody to fellowship with. Amen. Paul explains that uh, in 1 Corinthians chapter 2. He says, for what man knoweth the things of a man, save the spirit of man which is in him. Even so, the things of God knoweth no man but the spirit of God. Now, we have received not the spirit of the world, but the spirit which is of God, that we might know the things freely given to us of God. When we get born again, we receive something that Adam lost. We receive the spirit of God. Now, the problem is we live in this sinful body of flesh, and as soon as we receive that spirit, a war begins. And it's a war between the spirit and the flesh. And that war lasts just as long as you're in that body, okay? Okay. But that helps to begin to restore that fellowship, okay, that was lost. Now, when God made Adam, he said, uh, the Bible tells us that uh, God made these creatures out, out of the ground, and then he would take them to Adam, and he would uh, say, well, what do you call this one, Adam? And whatever Adam named them, that's what their name was. Well, let me ask you a question. Uh, why would God have Adam name the creatures because he had dominion. He was the king, and it was under his dominion, and he named them. But not only that, had to do with fellowship. They had something to walk together and talk about and fellowship over in the garden in the cool of the day when, when, they, would, when they would be together. So it was a matter of fellowship, but it was also a matter of Adam's dominion. He, those were the things under his control, and he had a right to name them. God gave him that right when he gave him dominion. But now we know what happened uh, to the story here, and that is that Mr. and Mrs. Adam, after Eve was made, Mr. and Mrs. Adam, they messed up. They got kicked out of the garden, right? Now, this had to be fixed if God was ever going to have that real fellowship that he wanted. And that is what God's after. That's why when you get to Revelation uh, chapter, I believe it's chapter 22, and uh, what you read is, might be 21, I can't remember exactly because my brain leaks more now than it used to years ago. But 
Um, what you read is that God says, he makes a new heaven and a new earth, and he says, I will dwell with them, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. He's looking to restore that. Everything in between the fall and, and that where he says that in Revelation 21, everything in between that is what God went through to fix the problem. Okay? That's, that's what this Bible's about right there. Okay, so if he wants the real fellowship, if he wants to have that, if he's ever going to have that real fellowship he wants, then he's going to have to fix that problem. And so in Genesis, he begins to fix the problem. Because when Adam and Eve fell, God, uh, if you remember, he went and talked to Adam and Eve and the serpent, right? And uh, Adam's like, uh, uh, what'd you do? And he said, what's well, that woman? <laughs> right? And she said, it's the snake, you know? And uh, so God deals with that serpent, which, of course, is the devil. And then he, God makes a prophecy. And he tells him, he says, you know, one day the seed of the woman is going to bruise the serpent's head. But there's something funny about that statement. Because a woman don't have a seed. See, that's actually a statement on the virgin birth. A woman don't have a seed. The man, you read the Bible, men have a seed. Women, you know, even, even today, women have an egg, right? That's, that's the part that they carry. They don't carry the seed. But the seed of the woman will bruise the serpent's head. So there's a veiled reference to the virgin birth, but it was enough that the devil got it. He understood. And so what happens next in Genesis chapter 6? What happens next? is an attempt is made to try and destroy the seed. Why? Why destroy the seed? Because if the seed becomes corrupted, and if humanity is no longer human, then the prophecy fails by default. And so we read in Genesis chapter 6 that the sons of God saw the daughters of men, that they were fair. They took them wives of all which they chose. And there were giants in the earth in those days. You believe in giants? I do. I believe Goliath really existed. You know, guys nine and a half feet tall. I believe all king of Bashan looked down at Goliath. I believe all king of Bashan was 13 feet tall. I believe the tallest man in this room would have come up to his belt buckle. An intimidating fellow, to be sure. Amen? And yeah, I believe it. I have a book at home called The Encyclopedia of Giants. It's stuffed full of uh, uh, reprints of newspapers for the last 200 years of, uh, of people where they said they found giant skeletons in this mound and that mound, all the way from California to New York, across the whole country. And that's not just America. It's also all over, all over around the world. Every culture in the world has some, uh, some kind of history, some kind of story about giants, every one of them. It's like the flood. It's universal. They all have some kind of flood story. You know, it must have really happened if everybody has the same story. Amen? You know, the stories may vary over time, but they all got the same basic features. All right, so there's these giants. Now, by the way, if your Bible says Nephilim, if there were Nephilim in the earth in those days, and not, don't say giants, all they did was transliterate that word so they didn't have to translate it because they was ashamed to admit they believed in giants. I, would, I wouldn't even use a Bible like that. No, it was giants, and there's no point in trying to hide that. And what they did back then, those giants, uh, they cohabitated with the daughters of men. There were giants in the earth in those days. That's how those giants came into existence. There has to be some explanation for how they arrived. Amen? There has to be some kind of explanation for how they got here. But that's not all, because the Bible says all flesh had corrupted itself upon the earth. They had messed around with the animal kingdom, too. You say, well, you can't mix, you know, all these different animals and stuff. Hey, guess what? They're doing it now. They're doing it right now. You can buy a CRISPR Cas9 kit and you can edit your cat with some kind of glow in the dark jellyfish stuff or whatever and make your cat glow in the dark. You know, that's how crazy this stuff is now. You can buy that CRISPR Cas9 kit for less than $300 if you know how to do it. The world's gone nuts. I mean, if you. I can't get into that now, but that's called transhumanism. And if you've never seen the video called Inhuman, the last and final phase of man, you need to watch it. 
because they're messing with the genetic code in a way that you can't even imagine. And it's not just, it's not just one or two places. It's 10,000 places in this world where they got labs doing that. And, uh, and, and you may think I'm nuts, but I'm going to tell you right now, that coronavirus, that was man-made. That's a bioweapon, and it's got more genetic garbage in it than you can imagine. I almost died from it, okay? And when I was getting better, Pam, you sang, I listened to your song, uh, Oh Lord, and I wept every day as I listened to that and got better. Yeah, just so you know that. All right, so... Now, of course, uh, God wasn't going to let them corrupt the human race like that so that he couldn't come through on his, on his prophecy. So he moved to get a man. The man's name was Noah. And the Bible says that Noah was perfect in his generations. Now, that doesn't mean that Noah was sinless. That's not what it's talking about. It's talking about Noah was a pure genetic stock. That's what it's talking about. God made a move to save humanity before it got all messed up and wasn't human anymore. Okay, because the truth of the matter is Goliath was not human. He was some kind of hybrid. He was some kind of mutation. He wasn't human. Okay, so God gets Noah. Now, here's what it says about Noah. These are the generations of Noah. Generations. Okay, now that has to do with lineage, right? These are the generations of Noah. Noah was a just man and perfect in his generations. And Noah walked with God, and Noah begat three sons, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. Noah begat. He begat three sons. Now, here's what's happening. This seed, God has picked out a seed now, right? He's going to have a seed, the seed of the woman. But that has to come down through generations now. And now here's a fork, there's a triple fork in the road. Which way does it go? Shem, Ham, or Japheth? Well, Noah prophesies. He says, uh, blessed be the Lord God of Shem. And that's the direction that the prophecy goes. Amen? So that's the fork that it takes. In the process of time, Shem, going through the line of Shem, God picks a guy named Abraham. Well, named Abram. Later, God changes his name to Abraham, which means a father of many nations, right? All right, now here's what God says to Abraham. Because God, out, out of that line of Shem, God says, uh, let's run it through Abraham now. Okay? And here's what he says to Abraham. Now the Lord said unto Abram, Get thee out of thy country, and from thy kindred, and from thy father's house, unto a land that I will show thee. And I will make of thee a great nation, and I will bless thee, and make thy name great, and thou shalt be a blessing, and I will bless them that bless thee, and curse him that curseth thee, and in thee shall all the families of the earth be blessed. Abraham's chosen. He's chosen. He's going to be a nation. You know what that means? That means seed. Amen. That means humanity. He's going to be given land. Amen. Because you know what? For a nation to be a nation it has to have real estate. You can't be a nation without real estate, so they got to have land, right? And then he says that all the families of the earth will be blessed because of Abraham. And it's not because everybody's going to live over in Israel, and it's not because uh, it's not because everybody's going to be of the lineage of Abraham. It's going to be because something very special is going to come from the lineage of Abraham in the land of Israel. Amen. All right, so. Abraham ends up having two kids that we're going to talk about. He ends up having, he gets a promise that he's going to have a son. And him and Sarah, they wait a long time, but they begin to think, you know, I think God's dropped the ball. I don't, I don't, I don't know that he's going to give us this kid that he talked about. I don't, I don't, it's, look, it's not happening. Well, I'll tell you what we'll do. Uh, I'm going to give you my maid, Hagar, and you can go into her, Abraham, and then she'll have a child, and, and uh, we'll, we'll call that it. And they ended up doing that, and they had a kid named Ishmael. Promise can't go through Ishmael. Why? Because Ishmael was a product of the flesh. That's them trying to do God's work for him. It ain't going to go. Has to be the child of promise. Amen? And eventually, God comes through on that promise when they think it's no longer possible. Amen? Because that's how God does stuff. You know, my preacher used to tell me, Brother Mark, God's never early and he's never late. He's always right on time. And I say, I know a preacher, but he always looks like he's going to be late. You know, 
That's how it looks. You know, he, he, he likes to show up late when it looks like nothing can be done. But he did. He showed up, and, and they had Isaac. And the, the, the fork in the road between Ishmael and Isaac, Isaac, the fork takes Isaac. Amen? Now the seed continues down. Isaac ends up having two boys, Jacob and Esau. And if you ever read your Bible, it says, Jacob have I loved, but Esau have I hated. Esau ends up being a picture of a guy who's carnal, doesn't care anything about spiritual stuff, and he's all about the flesh. That's what Esau ends up being a picture of, and God ain't interested in that. So it goes through Jacob. Amen? Fork in the road takes Jacob. Now, that fork in the road... Well, let me tell you what Abraham was prophesied by the Lord. Um, no, I'll get to that in a minute. That fork in the road goes through Jacob. And if you remember the story of Jacob, uh, Stephen puts it this. Jacob had, had 12 sons, right? And um, the, uh, Stephen in Acts chapter 7, he's telling about this history. And he says this. He says the patriarchs, that is, that is Jacob's boys, his 12 boys, says the patriarchs moved with envy, sold Joseph into Egypt, but God was with him. If you know the story, what happened was, uh, was uh, uh, Jacob had a special liking for Joseph that the other brothers hated. They despised it. And one day he went out into the field to see what they're, how they're doing with the sheep out there, and they're like, oh boy. You know, this guy's been having dreams. He thinks he's better than us, you know, and uh, we're done with him. Let's kill him. And they, they finally decided not to kill him, but instead they sold him to a bunch of Ishmaelites who took him into Egypt, and then he was in Egypt in bondage, and he was a slave, okay? But God blessed him the whole time he was there, and oddly enough, God brought, ended up promoting him to second in command in Egypt. And one day there was a famine, and because of the famine, his brothers had to go to Egypt to get grain. And lo and behold, who do they meet in Egypt? <laughs> Somebody they thought they'd never see again. Turns out to be Joseph, you know. And I'm sure that was quite startling after what they did to him, amen? You know, but what happened was, is God was moving the nation of Israel, which at that time, that nation consisted of somewhere around 70 people. That's all it was. Into Egypt. And they were there for 400 years. Now, you want to hear something interesting? I just covered 2,000 years of history. By the time you get to the end of the book of Genesis, chronologically, you're halfway through the Old Testament. 38 more books to go, <laughs> but you're halfway through the Old Testament's history. That's interesting, right? 2,000 years it took God to get to this place. He don't, he don't do stuff real fast most of the time. He's very methodical about what he does, all right? All right, so. Now, many years earlier, this is what I was going to say a few minutes ago, but many years earlier, God told Abraham that one day uh, what would happen to his descendants and he said this to Abraham. He said, Know of a surety that thy seed shall be a stranger in a land that is not theirs, and shall serve them, and they shall afflict them 400 years. And also that nation whom they serve will I judge, and afterward shall they come out with great, uh, with great substance. So sure enough, what God do? Abraham's descendants, uh, the children of Israel, they became slaves while they were in the land of Egypt. Right? And Stephen... Uh, in Acts chapter 7, talks about it, and he says this. He says, But the time when the promise drew nigh, which God had sworn unto Abraham, the people grew and multiplied in Egypt, till another king arose, which knew not Joseph. And what we find out is that king made him serve with hard bondage. What happened when Israel went to Egypt? What happened was they were very prolific. They multiplied like rabbits. Them 70 people that went down there ended up turning into about a million and a half. And the Egyptians are looking at it, and they're going, wow, these Jews, man, they, like they're everywhere. You know, we got to do something about this. Uh, you know what? We'll make them slaves. That's what we'll do. We'll have them build our treasure cities, you know, and they can make bricks and, and stuff like that. That's what we'll do with them. 
but they kept multiplying. And then they're like, ah, throw their baby boys in the river. You know, let's, we got to do something, man. They multiplied. Why did God send them there? So they could multiply. And he's created a whole nation now within a nation. They're all there. Now, even though the Egyptians made them slaves and made them serve with rigor, yet God multiplied them and blessed them. They didn't feel blessed, but that didn't mean they weren't blessed. Amen? Now, then one day, God raises up Aaron and Moses. All right, so the Bible says, this is that Aaron and Moses to whom the Lord said, bring out the children of Israel from the land of Egypt according to their armies. For the first time, Israel is designated as an army for the first time when they're ready to leave Egypt. A whole ragtag army it was too. It was just a bunch of slaves. But God says, you're an army. Amen? So they bring them out. Now, the Bible says this, Christian, endure hardness as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. You know what them people endured in Egypt? They endured hardness. You know what it takes of a soldier? It takes hardness. It takes hardness. There's this thing called basic training where what they're trying to do is make, get you used to hard things. You know why? Because when you go to war, you're going to live hard things. And that's how war is. War is an ugly business. And it's not pleasant. And it's not easy. And you have to learn how to suffer and bear up under it. Right? And they, that was the lesson they learned in Egypt as they became an army. That's what God's doing in the background, and they don't see it. Hard times make good soldiers, and an army needs hard soldiers. But an army also needs order. And so when they came out of Egypt, did you read how God had them set their camps up in order? You got the Reubenites here, and you got uh, Judah over here, and you got uh, Manasseh here, and you got, you know, Dan and Naphtali and Simeon, and, and everybody had their proper spot in the camp because it can't be chaos because you can't have an army with chaos. Amen? Armies have to be ordered. Uh, I, to tell you a quick little story, when I uh, first joined the army, which I had to do, uh, I got in trouble. And uh, anyway, um, I got off the bus down there in uh, um, Fort Bliss, Texas. And there was these footprints on the asphalt, and everybody had to get off the bus and stand on a set of footprints. And so we're all standing, because that's how they teach you how to stand in formation, <laughs> you know, to have order. So everybody's dressed right and covered down, is what they call it. Everybody's in line the way they're supposed to be. And then they said, March. And we started marching. I couldn't keep time, man. <laughs> and uh, let's just put it this way. I got, I inherited immediately a very nasty nickname because I couldn't march right. Uh, it, took me, it took me a while to get enough rhythm to be able to march. You know, some of you people got rhythm. You know, I had to develop mine. It still ain't that good. Okay, so he sets them up with order by their standards. So now they got their standards, and every camp has its own area, and he's beginning to establish order throughout the people because an army has to have order. Now, uh, Abraham was promised that his descendants would be a nation, and a nation must have property, right? So they don't have any property yet. So here's what happened. They come out of Egypt, and then if you remember, they go to Mount and, and uh, the, Moses went up to God, and the Lord called unto him out of the mountain, saying, Thus saith the, uh, um, thus shalt thou say to the house of Jacob, and tell the children of Israel. Here's what you're going to tell them, Moses. You have seen what I did unto the Egyptians, and how I bear you on eagles' wings, and brought you unto myself. Now, therefore, if you will obey my voice indeed, and keep my covenant, then you shall be a peculiar treasure unto me above all people. For all the earth is mine, and you shall be unto me a kingdom of priests and an holy nation. These are the words which thou shalt speak unto the children of Israel. And all the people answered together and said, All that the Lord has spoken, we will do. An agreement is made. 
I'm going to be your God, and I'm going to really bless you if you obey. Oh, yeah. Yeah, we'll obey. Yeah. All right, so a nation has to have, so, so uh, right after that, um, Moses goes up the hill, and you know what he gets? The Ten Commandments. What are the Ten Commandments? That is the constitution for the nation of Israel. That is the, the moral basis of their law right there. They, they met their God. Their God has revealed himself according to who he is. He says, I'm a holy God. You're going to have to do things right if you're going to serve me. Now, if their God had been Molech, they would have had a whole different set of laws. Get what I'm saying? You know, uh, if it would have been Baphomet, there would be a whole different set of laws. If it would have been, I mean, if it would have been Dagon, the God, it would have been a whole different set of laws. But it was, it was holy God Almighty, and he gave him rules that, uh, that go with his personal character. Because it is, a, it is a nation's understanding of their deity that shapes their morality. And it's required for a nation. You can't really have laws unless you have some basis to, to base them upon. Amen? In America, we based ours upon Jesus Christ. And we understood that the backdrop of that was God was holy and that them Ten Commandments were a good thing for a society to function by. And it created a successful society when people did it. Now, we've, we've left that path real bad. But that's the, that is the basis of our nation right there. All right, so they got a moral code as a result of that law. Uh, they got a belief in a holy God. They got a national religion where they were supposed to, this is how I want, if you're going to serve me, this is how you do it. And they ended up with 613 uh, laws and ordinances that showed them how to do it correctly. That, that's what they had. And would to God, in America, we only had 613 laws. Have you ever been to a law library? I'm telling you, I went to a law library in Ohio Northern University, and it would have filled this entire room with books, floor to ceiling, wall to wall, front to back. And nobody in the world knows all that law. If they couldn't do 613, what do you think they can do with that mess? Right? All right. Now, to be a nation, Abraham's descendants must have property. So Moses did what? He sent out the spies, right? You boys go check out that land over there that God's given us. Come back, give us a report. And they did. They came back, and here's what they said. They said, we're not able to go up against those people. We can't fight them. Uh, it says they brought up an evil report of the land which they had searched, saying, It is a land that eateth up the inhabitants thereof. And there we saw the giants. And we were as grasshoppers in their sight, and so were we in our own sight. You know, they, they encountered the giants there. And they were afraid to go in and do it. In fact, they said, We're not going. We're not. Are you crazy? We're not going in there, Moses. No way. Now, Israel had an army, but the army wasn't trained. They were just a, it was just a bunch of ragtag slaves that had come out of Egypt. That's all they were right now, amen? And when they looked around at themselves, they didn't see themselves as being an army. You understand what I'm saying? They're like, I know how to make bricks. I don't know anything about fighting, you know? I know how to, I know how to feed sheep. I know how to do cattle. I know, you know, I know how to say, yes, sir. You know, to, to, a, to a boss. That's, that's all they knew. They just couldn't see themselves as being an army. It's the same problem we have, Christian people. You're soldiers of Jesus Christ. But when you look around, you don't see yourself as an army. You know why? Because most of you aren't trained. That's why. Soldiers have to be trained, amen? Soldiers require training. I went to I went to a thing called boot camp, you know, and in boot camp they train you, and it doesn't stop after you're out of boot camp. That's just entry level training, you know. It goes beyond that once you get out. But most of God's people don't see themselves as being part of an army. I mean, onward, Christian soldier, marching as to war, amen, with the cross of Jesus going on before, and all that. 
But what they didn't comprehend is God said, I will fight your battles. It don't matter that you're a ragtag army because <laughs> I'll take care of it. And you know the stuff he did. If you read the Bible, uh, there's times where he sent down hail upon the enemies, beat them to the ground. There's times, I mean, there's times he sent hornets in and they're stinging them while they're trying to fight. That's dirty <laughs> in a way. Think, I think about that, man. What if you're in a fight and, and a bunch of hornets come out and you're the only guy getting stung? You know, but you know, God was, God was on their side, man. And I'm sure, I'm sure the Philistines and all them guys didn't like that none, but that's how it went. God said, I can do this for you, you know, but they just couldn't see it. They just couldn't see it. And the truth of the matter is we sing a lot of songs about everything that God can do, but most of God's people can't see it either. They just can't see that God can do whatever it is needs to be done. And we typically rely upon our own flesh to do it. And it don't work right. Here's what the Bible tells us. It says, we are the circumcision which worship God in spirit and rejoice in Christ Jesus and have no confidence in the flesh. We're not supposed to trust our own ability. We're supposed to rely on God, amen? That's who we trust. That's who we rely upon. All right? So uh, Israel had promised to obey God, but they broke their promise because they would not go into the promised land. They wouldn't do it. All right, so what happened? Well, you know the story if you read the Bible. Uh, they spent 40 days searching out the land. God said, okay, 40 days. Uh, I'm gonna, we're going to do 40. You did 40 days searching the land. I'm going to each day for a year. We're going to do 40 years out in the wilderness. We're going to do some training out there for 40 years. Amen. And he said, you're going to know my breach of promise. You know, just like you broke your promise, I'm not going to hold up my end for a while. You know. Okay, so there they go. They do 40 years of basic training out in the wilderness. And in the wilderness, they accomplished four things. You know what they accomplished? And maybe more, but I can think of four things they accomplished. Number one, they began to understand the nation was so, shown to be a single unit. They began to move in unison out there. They had their camp all set up. When the ark could get up and go, they'd follow the ark. When the ark had set down, then they, they, would, they would pitch camp. You know, they began to learn how to follow their leader, God. Amen? The nation was punished as a unit, as an army. You know, when, when an army loses the battle, uh, the whole army loses the battle. It's not just one guy loses the battle. When the army loses the battle, the army loses the battle. And they began to learn that they're actually a fighting unit. You know, they're all joined together. These disobedient soldiers were weeded out. Remember over the 40 years, all the people that wouldn't enter, they got weeded out of the program, right? And it was their children who were raised up and trained in the wilderness that became the next, ar the next uh, army. And the soldiers, uh, those that did grow up, uh, those are the ones that learned how to follow God. All right, so now, now they're all grown up and they got them in an army. So 40 years later now, under Joshua's leadership, they enter Israel and conquer the promised land. Everything went perfect when they attacked Jericho. Everything, they obeyed. Every, the walls came down, they went up, they fought, they conquered the whole city. Everything went out without a hitch, except one thing. One thing. There was one soldier who took some gold and some silver and a nice, a nice outfit, a nice garment, and he took it back and he hid it. And they weren't supposed to do it. They were told not to. And he just couldn't help it. He went and did it. And it, look at what God's response to that was. He, well, what happened then after that, okay, so after that great victory, they're like, woohoo, man, we, we're doing it now. And uh, the next city is a little tiny one. And they're like, yeah, AI. they're like, uh, hey, uh, we don't need to send the whole army up there. Why, they're just a bunch of little guys. We'll send up more than enough, but we don't need to send everybody. So they send their army up there, and they got their hind end handed to them. And they come running back like a bunch of scared girls. Ah! You know, and they're like, what happened? What happened? And you know what God said? Here's what happened. He said, Israel hath sinned. 
and therefore Israel could not stand before her enemies. One guy sinned, and a whole army was attributed with it. You know what? You know what people think? They think that their sin ain't too big a deal, especially if nobody knows. But you know what the truth of the matter is? Uh, you're you aren't the only person your sin affects. You don't know what all it does. You don't know. I can guarantee you that guy didn't think it affected the whole army. There's always ripple effects of that stuff that we don't see and we don't comprehend. And so you ought not to think that your sin is inconsequential because it's not. It's not. All right, so... After, jo- after they get that straightened out in Joshua, they go and they conquer the land. And then they enter the book of Judges. And you know what happens in the book of Judges? Okay, so they've got their land and they're doing good. And then Joshua dies and the guys that outlived Joshua died. And then the next thing you know, they're running to heathen gods. And then they lose their land. And then uh, they, they get right. God raises up a judge. They get right. They get their land back. And they're a nation again, and then they turn to idol worship, and they lose their land. And it just happens over and over and over and over in the book of Judges. That's what happens in the book of Judges. And the last, the very last verse in the book of Judges sums up the whole thing. It says, there was no king in Israel, so every man did that which was right in his own eyes. That can't be the way we operate. Amen? It can't be. You, we just, this thing, this Christianity just can't be. You do whatever you think is good. No, we got it. We got a king. Amen. Okay, so book of Samuel. Remember that book of Samuel, Samuel the prophet. And uh, but but uh, Eli, the guy that trained Samuel, his, his boys were wicked, and then Samuel didn't learn anything from that. So he raised up some boys, and they were wicked. You know, and the people got fed up, and they said, we want a king like the nations round about us. And you know what God told Samuel? He said, Samuel, don't be upset about this because they haven't rejected you from being king. They rejected me. God was their king. But, you know, they didn't like that king they couldn't see. They didn't want him. They wanted a king like the nations, so they ended up getting Saul. And you know what Saul turned out to be? A loser. You know what he was? He, he turned out to be a, a proud, uh, fearful, um, murderous, demon-possessed suicide is what he turned out to be. A loser. We got the same kind of caliber of people running our country. Bums, you know. Makes me wonder if America hadn't traded her gods. Amen? So, you know, God said, okay, Samuel, tell them they can have their king that's like them, but tell them what manner of person the king's going to be. Tell them how this thing's going to work because they're not going to like it. And here's what Samuel told him. God said, uh, Samuel told all the words to, uh, of the Lord unto the people that asked him a, a king, and here's what he said. This will be the manner of the king that shall reign over you. He will take your sons and appoint them for himself, for his chariots, to be his horsemen, and some shall run before his chariots. And he will appoint him captains over thousands and captains over fifties. And he will set them to ear his ground and to reap his harvest and to make his instruments of war and instruments of his chariots. And he'll take your daughters to be confectionaries and to be cooks and be bakers. And he will take your fields and your vineyards and your olive yards, even the best of them, and give them to his servants. And he will take a tenth of your seed and of your vineyards and, and give to his officers and his servants. And he will take your men servants and your maid servants and your goodliest young men and your asses, that is your donkeys, and put them to his work. And he will take the tenth of your sheep and you shall be his servants. And you shall cry out in that day because your king which you have shall, that you have chosen you. And the Lord will not hear you in that day. And that's where we're at in America right now. You know, we've got, we've, they're taking everything now. There's no limit to what, and they don't just come take it out of your house. What they do, they just print more money, make yours worth less. You know, and they don't ask, and they give it to whoever they want. 
And that's where we're at now. We're following these same kind of patterns, okay? So Israel got the king named Saul, and he was a loser. And then after him came a guy named David. And David was a great king. David was probably the best king Israel had. But even David was just a man. And if you remember the story of David, even though he was a man after God's own heart, the, the amount of power that he had, he could not keep from abusing it all the time. And he ended up um, seducing uh, a married woman named Bathsheba and then having her husband murdered in battle. Now, people say, well, that's so terrible. It is, but you also don't know what it's like to have the kind of authority he had. He had the kind of authority that any day of the week, at any time of the day, he could just say, cut their head off, and it would be done. And it was no big deal. It happened all the time. People were executed if needed to be. You know, so it'd be hard not to abuse an authority that was unlimited. You get what I'm saying? It'd be hard, you know. And David didn't do it perfectly. He did it pretty good, but he didn't do it perfectly. Then after him came his son Solomon. And Solomon is the son of David. Does that name sound familiar to you? Jesus, thou son of David, have mercy on me. Jesus was called the son of David too, right? You know, well, why is he called why is he called the son of David? Well, Solomon ends up being one of the greatest types of Christ in the Bible. And and his kingdom was the height of Israel's prosperity and peace. That was Solomon's reign right there. Said this about Solomon. King Solomon's drinking vessels were of gold, and none of it was silver. Silver was nothing to be accounted of in the days of Solomon. He made silver to be in Jerusalem as stones. Now silver is 30 bucks an ounce. You know, he had tons of it. But people didn't consider it worth anything. But the funny thing about Solomon is, you know, you've heard of the wisdom of Solomon, right? Well, one of the things the Bible said about the kings, they weren't supposed to multiply wives. Turns out Solomon uh, had 700 wives and 300 concubines. You know what it says about them wives? It says they were outlandish women. You know what an outlandish woman is? a woman from the outlands. You know what they weren't supposed to do? They weren't supposed to marry them heathen women. Why? Because God said, you marry them heathen women, they'll turn your heart away from God. And you know what happened to Solomon? Them 700 women and 300 concubines, them outlandish women, they turned his heart away from God. And Solomon ended up an idolater. Amen. And because of Solomon, the kingdom got torn. If you remember that prophecy, ten, 10 nations became the northern tribes and two the southern tribes because of Solomon's sin. That's interesting. Okay, but check this out. Something weird happens then. And here's what it says. This is uh, 1 Kings 10, 14. It said, the weight of gold that came to Solomon in one year why does God tell you how much gold came to, came to Solomon? He's trying to get something across to you. The weight of gold that came to Solomon in one year was uh, 600, three score, and six talents of gold. You know what that is? That's 666. Well, isn't that interesting? Well, on its own, it might not mean much, but four verses later, you know what it says? That Solomon's throne of ivory tells you all about his ivory throne. His throne of ivory, it had... Um, um, six steps going up to the throne and six lions on each side. Six, six, six. And you know what's interesting about Solomon is from that point right there forward, he becomes a type of the Antichrist in the Bible. He's an, he's an idolater and he's all messed up and so much for the wisdom of Solomon. Amen? Okay, so from here, you know what the rest of the story is in the Old Testament? It's Judah and Israel failing to keep their kingdom. That's pretty much the rest of the story through the rest of the Old Testament. It's just battles back and forth, getting their kingdom, losing their kingdom, getting their kingdom, losing their kingdom. You know, uh, a good, they got a good king, then a bad king takes over next. And it's just, it's just up and down, up and down, up and down the whole way. 
A good king is usually replaced by a bad king. We got it here too. You know, we had George Washington. We had a good king. You know, we got Joe Biden, you know, and uh, things aren't going so well right now, you know. Sin kept causing their kingdom to be conquered. Guess what's happening to America? You know what the Bible says? It says because of the transgressions of a land, many are the princes thereof. You know why we have such a vast bureaucracy? Because we're a sinful nation. The, the more sin you got, the more rulers you got. And we got a boatload of them now. Amen? Now, check this out. Israel had most everything they needed. Now, here's what, here's what God did through all that time. All right? So uh, Israel had the God of Abraham, right? They were the seed that was chosen as the descendants of Abraham, right? They had laws. God gave them good laws, and when they obeyed them and kept that national constitution, things went well for Israel. They had laws. They had property now because God gave them property. They were slaves in Egypt, but now they had property. You know, they had borders to protect. They had armies to protect the borders with. But, you know, here's the problem that they had. What they didn't have was a righteous king all the time. Because sometimes they'd have a righteous king and things would go good, and then, they'd, then he'd die, and then they'd have a rotten king and things would go bad. You know, and so the problem they had was with their king. What they needed, you know what they needed? You know what the solution is obvious? They needed a righteous king that would live forever. That'd solve their problem. And that brings us to the New Testament. 4,000 years transpired, 39 books later, but look how the New Testament begins. Look at the first verse of the New Testament. The book of the generation of Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham. The generation. It's about genes again. Why is it saying that? It's because it's showing that Jesus comes from the lineage of David and the lineage of Abraham. That's, that's what this whole uh, beginning of this first chapter is about. It's about proving the lineage of Jesus Christ. And it turns out he's the seed of the woman. Amen. So Jesus comes and he begins to preach, saying, repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. The kingdom of heaven is here. You know, now Israel hadn't operated as an independent nation for centuries. For centuries, they hadn't operated as an independent nation. And what Jesus was doing was he was offering them what they truly needed. And what did they truly need? They needed a righteous king who'd live forever. And you know how God delivered that? The Bible says God was manifest in the flesh. Amen? God came and said, I am the solution to your kingdom problem. I'm the solution for you. Jesus also comes preaching. He came to Galilee preaching the gospel of the kingdom of God, saying the time is at hand and the kingdom of God is at hand. The kingdom of God is at hand. Repent ye and believe the gospel. We got these two kingdoms showing up because we got the only king that can run them both. Amen. We got the righteous king who, can, who is God manifest in the flesh, totally righteous. And he's also going to be the one qualified to run that kingdom. He's there for them, amen? And, and uh, if you remember what he told them back, I covered this back at the very beginning. Sermon on the Mount. Take no thought, saying, what shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or wherewithal shall we be clothed? Your heavenly Father knoweth that you have need of these things. But seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. You can have the kingdom, but you got to have it in righteousness. David said, uh, he that ruleth over men must be just, ruling in the fear of God. You know, that's what it takes to have the kingdom and keep it. And that's why we're losing ours right here in America, because we're not a just nation any longer. Amen? And Jesus is saying, I can give you this. I can give you this. So what, what, what did happen? 
Okay, God started the seed. He chose a family to run the seed through. It ended up in Jacob. Jacob goes down into Israel and is multiplied into a million and a half people, and it becomes an army. He gives them laws. He gives them uh, a, a religion to serve him by. He gives them a man as a king. Uh, and uh, even after all this, they couldn't do the right thing. So God came to this planet as a man to pay for their sin, to give them a new birth, and to become the righteous king that they needed. That's what God did. And when you read the Old Testament, this is a continuing saga of how God, everything, it's, it's how patiently the Lord went through all this garbage of, of what people did in order that he might provide what they really want. And they turned it down. <laughs> they turned it down. They said, no, thanks. The physical kingdom is promised to Israel, and they are going to get it one day. You know, there will be a time in the future where the Bible talks about it. They're going to get it one day. But the spiritual kingdom belongs to us, too. Amen? It's not just Israel's. It's us, too. We get in on the spiritual kingdom. Now, they, those people didn't receive it. They didn't receive that physical kingdom or, or the spiritual kingdom as a nation. They, they turned it down. But the physical kingdom is offered to us. Will you receive it? What do you do with it? Amen? You mean after everything that God went through? After that whole story of what God went through, what will you do with that spiritual kingdom? Will you receive that? Jesus said, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. God has to do something for you in order for you to see it. And you have to be willing to let him. Yes. Amen? Yes. Except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Jesus said, marvel not that I said unto you, you must be born again. You know why you shouldn't marvel? Look at the past. Look what happened. Those people can't do it on their own. Amen? They can't do it. God's doing it for you. Amen? All you got to do is go to him. And when you look at the Old Testament from that, from that thousand foot high view where you can see the whole picture, it's really, it's really quite beautiful what God has done. Sometimes people read the Old Testament and they think God's mean. Are you kidding me? Look at what he put up with, man, for 4,000 years. You know, he's not mean. He's gracious and he's patient. It took him a long time to get that thing to the place where he could hand them the whole thing and they turned it down, you know. But there's a lot of people turning it down today too. But what will you do? Amen? I preached... 4,000 years in one hour and one minute. But the question is, what are you going to do? I think Pilate asked that question really good. He said, what shall I do with Jesus who is called Christ? That's a good question. What are you going to do with him? Amen? Except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Let's have a word of prayer. Father, we come before you in the name of Jesus. I am amazed, Lord, at everything that you went through and how methodical you were and how even the stuff like the slavery that was terrible, that you meant it for good. You created an army with it. You, you toughened them up. You got them ready to do that thing which was promised. It was a great honor for them, Lord God, to be the chosen people, to be the people that would bring forth the scriptures, the people that would bring forth the Messiah, the people that could be the city that was set on a hill that could not be hid. It was a great honor for them to be that. They just didn't have the heart for it at the time. But sometimes, God, we get like that too. And it's a great honor for us to be what we're supposed to be. And sometimes we don't have the heart for it. 
And I'm just praying, Father, that if that be the case, change our hearts. Amen. May we present them hearts to you. And like I said in the Proverbs, my son, give me thine heart. May we give them to you, God. And may you change them. And we'll thank you for that in Jesus' name. Amen.